move on. Let's see what else we can find. This is by the Gravel Institute. They're supposedly set up as the, the antidote to PragerU. So if you have the misfortune of being acquainted with PragerU, you know what they're all about. So this is kind of the, the actual leftist alternative. So they, they are not afraid to talk about things like socialism and anti-capitalist ideas and, and that sort of thing. So let's check out why didn't America adopt socialism? Let's see what they have to say. I don't think I've actually seen this one too. In so a lot of ways, begin. America is a strangely right-wing country. No universal health care, no universal child care, poor labor protections. Everyone knows this. But why is that? Well, if you look at American history, you actually find a pretty interesting reason. Unlike other industrialized countries, America never really had a powerful socialist movement. Compare that to Europe. In the 19th and 20th centuries, every country in Europe saw a huge socialist party develop. The Social Democratic Party in Germany, the Labour Party in the United Kingdom, the Socialist Party in Belgium. In countries like Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, parties with socialist roots governed for decades. Now, none of these countries ever became fully socialist. Instead, socialist parties and their- Yet, that, that, that's something that, that often is left out. People kind of seem like, seem to think there's an end to history just because a lot of these um, uh, social democracies, especially like in Scandinavia, like Sweden, Norway, Denmark, those sorts of countries, have kind of slid back since the, the time that they've been most um, socialist leaning, had the most actual socialist party power back in around like the 70s, that sort of thing. But I think it's no coincidence that that right after that time was the Reagan-Thatcher era of, of neoliberalism coming back in and really dominating the discourse. It was kind of the, the if you want to look at uh, the New Deal as the pendulum swinging about as far to the left as you can get and still be within capitalism, Reaganomics and, and Thatcherism was kind of the, the swing back, and that's dominated up until, I would put it at about uh, Occupy Wall Street, like the housing bubble, things finally just started, the wheels just started falling off, this, this uh, greed is good sort of um, don't help the poor because that hurts them mentality. And, and if you talk to a lot of leftists, myself included, that's kind of the time of uh, their first awakening, that there could be something beyond uh, what we've been told is possible beyond the solutions even of the, the most progressive Democrats of their time. So I would say we're in the, the, the swing back now the other way again, and I wouldn't be surprised to see some of these social democracies again turning back towards their, their socialist past. Uh, and history is not entirely linear. Like if you look at the development of capitalism, it wasn't all at once. It's not as though someone just said, I'm going to open a bank and uh, start lending money at, at this and such interest. And that was just, you know, the king had a heart attack and, and that was the end of the kingdom. No, the, the capitalist movements crushed time and time again before it finally took on as the, the dominant form. So there's no reason to think it wouldn't happen the same way for socialism. You're just going to have you're going to have back and forth. You're going to have backsliding. You're going to have forward progress. It's going to go it's probably going to be a long time before it it all gets to where a lot of us would like to see it go but that doesn't mean that it's it's just stalled out forever there's no reason to think that history has ended so just keeping that in mind their allies built well-functioning social democratic institutions it's what they called the european way universal health care generous welfare programs free education and strong protections for labor but that sort of transformation never happened in the United States. Now, to be fair, the U.S. did see a fairly strong progressive movement in the... It did happen, though. I mean, there were strong anarchist movements. Um, if you want to look into that, look into the, the Haymarket riots. It's one way that it's been labeled. Um, as well as union movements and, and things like that that did give us a lot of, uh, you know a big push towards socialism. There were robust socialist parties up until about the New Deal, and, and that was kind of... I, I, don't, I don't want to spoil it, so let's see where they go with this, but, but I may have more to say about that. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was the Working Man's Party of the 1870s, the governments of radical reconstruction, which W.E.B. Du Bois called dictatorships of the proletariat, and the leftist populist party, which won five states in 1892. 
There were even two members of the Socialist Party elected to Congress, and in 1912, Eugene Debs, the Socialist presidential candidate, received a full 6% of the national popular vote. The American Socialists were successful enough that in 1906, the leader of the German Social Democratic Party predicted that Americans will be the first to usher in a socialist republic. So why did the American left never gain power like the European left did? There are a few schools of thought about this. The most famous view, that of the German economist Werner Sombart, suggests that Americans were too prosperous and wealthy to believe in socialism. All socialist utopias, he said, came to nothing. Uh, that, that right there seems to be a, a very flawed opinion. The reason that, that there ever was a robust middle class, which has is, is still been dying about since the time of Reaganomics, you know, incidentally, uh, but the, the reason there ever was a major middle class was because of the labor movements, so because of socialist leanings and socialist ideas. Uh, so the idea that people were prosperous because of capitalism, no. On average, they were prosperous in spite of capitalism because of hard-fought gains from the labor movement, which was not itself a capitalist movement in any, by any stretch of the imagination. Thing on roast beef and apple pie. Socialism needed workers to live close together to form working class institutions. It could do that in places like Berlin or London or Paris, but not so much in sprawling America. Even as the country urbanized in the 20th century, it also suburbanized. Yeah, I'd, I'd say there probably is a lot of truth in, in this analysis. We are unique. Um, us, basically us and uh, I would say Australia and New Zealand among the, the quote unquote Western world, the, the more industrialized nations, in that we have a lot of land and, and relatively few people per square mile if you, if you spread everyone, everyone out evenly across the country. And what that tends to do is slow down the, the progress of ideas. Um, there's a reason that, that cities tend to be more progressive, uh, more liberal, more leftist even, than the countryside, and that's because you know, even in this information age where everyone's connected to the, the internet, ideas still travel by word of mouth as well and by local cult cultural mores and, and, and ideas that, that prevail. So even though the ideas are spreading more than they did, it's, it's still going to be more so in cities because you actually get to see the, the, the product of these ideas out in front. It's not, it's not as much of an abstract thing to, say, give gay people the right to marry or um, to live alongside people of different cultures. You may understand this idea living out in the country your whole life uh, or a good portion of your childhood growing up. You may understand this idea that, that these may be good things. Um, you may have been exposed to them on the internet or in books or whatever. But there is a big difference between thinking something and actually seeing it in action. So that, I, I think that's, that's, that's probably a, a fairly good take, that because America is so rural overall that, that these ideas didn't have the ability to spread as fast and as, as robustly as in Europe. Let's continue on. Though. Suburban sprawl promoted anonymity and atomization rather than the sense of community and solidarity that socialism needs to take root. And that's a good point, and that's why I like to try and bring in these, these new urbanist ideas when I'm talking about leftist ideas, because they really have to go hand in hand. If you have a, an entire suburb of people that all believe in leftist ideas, or even a good portion of them believe in leftist ideas, it still is a lot harder to organize based on those ideas just because of physical distance. And again, it's not the same to, to have a meeting out over Zoom as it, as it is to actually have a meeting hall place that's in everyone's neighborhood where they can, you know, where there's enough people around that say they can leave their, their kids with a, a babysitter who's, or one of many babysitters who's available in the neighborhood. Uh, well, they go to a meeting to talk about unionize, unionizing or to an actual union meeting if they have already been union, unionized. Man, that word is just sticking in my throat. Anyway, the point being, physical space makes it a lot harder to organize. Think if you wanted to hold a, a rally of some kind, like a, like a BLM rally or something like that, it's going to be a lot harder to do if it's at you know a strip mall that's that's way out in some suburb where maybe a few tens of thousands of people live, 
and there's of those people because of just the way that politics tend to go when you're spread out further um, a very small percentage is going to actually agree with you and then of those an even smaller percentage is going to be able to get out to the place and that's going to happen even in a city you're never going to get 100 percent participation it's just not there's too many factors too many moving variables but you're going to have the chance to get more of a, a group of people together to participate in something as simple as, as a march or, or a demonstration. Um, it's going to be a lot easier if you're already in the city where there's already just a lot of people around. And then you'll get people that are, you know, had no idea that this thing was going to take place, but they see a big crowd moving on and, th- and these things kind of build on themselves. Not so much the case in the suburbs where you're not even going to have as many people passing by. And if they do, they're going to be in a car. So they maybe just get a glance at what it is. They're like, oh, traffic ahead. Let's route around it, you know, that sort of thing. So that's why I advocate for new urbanist policies in addition to any sort of leftism that you may be enjoying. Because you can't, you know, I think it was Marx who said um, geography is destiny. And, that, and that's, that's a really true statement. When you think about it, when we're talking about trying to organize, you can't just ignore the geography of where you're at and, and hope to be successful. It's one of the reasons that the, the Amazon facility have trouble organizing itself. You know, they, they talked about how the traffic engineers changed the stoplights to make it so it was green more often when people are leaving at the end of their shift, right? So that so they're going to blow right past the picket lines, and or not the picket lines, but the people that are trying to to convince people to to vote for the union. Well, that doesn't work if most of the people live in the neighborhood that they work, you know, then they're just likely to walk on by and there's no traffic engineering scheme that could have gotten in the way of that. Likewise, people would have a lot more meeting places to meet outside of work that they all could get to. If all your employees of, of even a large warehouse like an Amazon warehouse, and I've worked in an Amazon warehouse, I was I was a delivery driver for like a couple months. I, I saw the writing on the wall very early on. Um, I, they, they, it was never going to be a viable job for myself. But but anyway, I've seen the inside of these these distribution warehouses. They're vast. There's easily three hundred people working, and this is not the this is not the fulfillment center. This is this is even just the distribution center where they bring all the packages to load them onto routes and then they go out into the, the various places. Well, this was out in the suburbs and I guarantee you that all of those employees lived in other parts. Like I didn't even live in the same city that, that that particular facility was in. So what do you do then? How do you, how, how would you even plan an after work event if people are going, you know, spreading out in, you know, maybe, 100 square mile radius, or not, not 100 square miles in any direction, but like just a 100 square mile area, basically. Um, how do you even organize something like that? It makes it a lot harder. So that, that's one reason to, to keep an eye on these sorts of new urbanist ideas of mixed use and compact walkable neighborhoods and, and that sort of thing, because it facilitates organization. Denser places like the Lower East Side of New York, at one point the most densely populated place on Earth, were hubs of socialism and radicalism Mm -hmm. of all shades. But the vast majority of places weren't like that. And the fact that there was so much land also meant that workers were constantly moving in search of better jobs. As late as the 1960s, about 20% of Americans moved every year. That rate of moving was way higher than in most European countries. And that central struggle, unifying and organizing a disparate working class, was made more difficult by a lot of other problems. Another source of division was occupation. Early attempts to form unifying working class organizations across different levels of skill, like the Knights of Labor in the 1880s, were destroyed by state terror and repression. There were also cultural and political distinctions that made building a party of the working class impossible. The fact that America had universal or near universal male suffrage at a relatively early date, decades before the United Kingdom, prevented voters from polarizing on class lines. That's part of why in the 19th and 20th centuries, many of the most dedicated socialists in America were Europeans importing socialist traditions from their home countries. It's no surprise that socialism tended to be strongest in immigrant communities, among Germans, Scandinavians, and Finns in the Midwest, and among Jewish immigrants in New York. 
And all of these difficulties in building a broad-reaching socialist coalition were compounded by the structure of American politics. Even today, think about how many times you've seen a friend on social media begging people not to vote third party because it will take away votes from another candidate. And this difficulty was made worse by the brutal repression of socialists, violence by state troops and private police forces against unions in the 19th and 20th centuries, the first Red Scare of 1919 to 1920, which saw many radicals jailed or deported, and then the second Red Scare of the 1950s, which saw socialists and communists blacklisted and fired. Even now, people who consider themselves communists are banned from immigrating to the United States. But the question isn't really why America never became a socialist country. After all, neither did any of those European countries. The real question is why, after the Democratic Party... I mean, depending on how you look at the USSR, at least part of Russia was European. As well as, uh, oh, it's gonna escape me now, Rom Romania? I'm not sure. There was a few others that, that did try at least to move towards socialist experiments. Whether or not they got there is another, you know, it's a matter of debate, but yeah, just kind of leaving that part out. But, but overall, good point. Party ...briefly became a social democratic party in the 1930s and 40s, America has been without any party pushing not just socialism, but any sort of redistribution to help ordinary people. That is the most bizarre absent feature of America. But of course, history isn't destiny. Denied opportunity their whole lives, forced into dead-end jobs, facing mountains of debt and grim prospects, more and more Americans, especially young ones, are identifying as socialists. Socialism never took root in America before, but that doesn't mean it can't now. This is Emma Viglin for the Gravel Institute. Yeah, and that, and that last point that she made is, is, is very good. You look at uh, Gen Z, and I just heard the term Gen Alpha, which supposedly is coming after Gen Z. I didn't think it was quite time for that yet. But anyway, the generations beneath millennial, and, and even millennials themselves, uh, are much more likely to identify as, as some flavor of actual leftists than, than even uh, uh, Gen Xers, and, and especially more so than boomers. And I think there's there's a there's a lot to be said about the the causes of that. I think uh the boomers have a lot to do with it, and that's not to say all boomers of course, but definitely the most rich and successful boomers have done their best to kind of shut that door behind themselves, allow college to rise in cost quite a bit. Um allowed social programs to, to fall away, you know, uh, getting rid of welfare, getting rid of uh, a lot of social programs. Um, so so that, has some, that has one thing to do with it, or that is one of the, the factors. But then also, for, for whatever reason, and, and, and I'm sure it's a combination of things, but uh, generation after generation owns less and less of the overall wealth of the country uh, than the one that comes before it. So I think it was something like, at this time, I just saw this statistic recently, it was something like, uh, at 40, uh, the boomers own something like 20% of the wealth. I don't know if it was the, of the world or if it was just talking about Americans, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and then... At that same age, at 40, Gen X owned more like, uh, I think it was 7% of, of, of the total wealth. And then now millennials, now that we're starting to approach 40, I'm almost there myself. And I'm kind of on that, that leading edge of, of millennials. Uh, but anyway, now that we are approaching 40s, we own something like 2, two to 4%. I think it was 4%. And then the, the guy who did that said that uh, if you if you account if you take out just Mark Zuckerberg uh, as as the most wealthy millennial, then then he alone accounts for two percent of of that four percent. So it paints an even worse picture for the overall percentage. So there's material differences between us and and past generations, and 
less likely to have a job in our field, even if we went to college, uh, less likely to, or more likely to have uh, to have lived with parents for much longer than in previous generations because of lack of economic opportunity, um, more likely to be involved in things like the gig economy, on and on and on by any metric, things are material worse, materially worse generation after generation. And, and we were kind of the first, the millennials are the first to experience that complete decline in, in standard of life and expectations and it's, it's just going to keep on go, getting worse as long as they, they keep on uh, not making any concessions to the later generations, to the people that really need help to, to get on their feet and get out there and uh, become more independent. So I think that's a big factor that, that's driving this push leftward because at that point, if you, if you don't see any sort of good future in store for you, your choices are to just rage against it, which a lot of people do, and that's when they tend to fall down that, that kind of alt-right pul- uh, pipeline. But thankfully, more people take the other route, and they're like, well, they, they actually look at the structural inequalities. They, they wonder about things like, oh, why is it that past generations had it better than us? Why is it that there's this, this inequality between the races or, or, or people that have different minority statuses? And, you know, the more you pull on that thread, the more it kind of unravels all these, these myths of, of capitalism, of, of living in a meritocracy. That's the big lie of uh, neoliberalism, which was really put, put in force in, during Reagan's time. Um, all these sorts of myths just start disappearing the more you tug on them. And they, you know, I was talking the other night with, with Sean from the Tribunus Plebis or Plebe's podcast. I think I'm saying that right now, finally. Um, oh, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, it's just you push just a little bit on, on most of these capitalist myths, and they just kind of poof into smoke. The idea that uh, there are great men of history that guide the entire fortunes of, of uh, the people. Uh, people like Elon Musk or whatever. You know, you push on any of these 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 stories just a little bit and you see that they're just fake. They're faked in one way or another. You know, he's, he's no way Tony Stark of, he's not a real life Tony Stark. Jeff Bezos is not some business genius, you know, neither is Bill Gates. They all got their money mostly from having wealthy, uh, parents and, and investors on their side, uh, from the get go. So, so that's just one example. But, you know, the idea that if you just keep your head down and you work hard, you're going to make it. That's that's obviously unraveling in front of our eyes. I mean, if you have two or three jobs just to, to scrape by, there's no way you're not working hard, okay? There's no way you're not uh, giving it your all. There's no way you could be l- really labeled as lazy if anyone took the time to look at your situation. Just myth after myth, you just push on a little bit, and it and it unravels, and and so then you have to to wonder what's the alternative. So it's 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 that 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 old question. I don't shoot, don't remember who said it, but it's it's basically um, socialism or barbarism, really, and barbarism just happens to lead you towards fascism, really. So those those tend to be the ways that people break, and that's that's a, a big reason why. I believe people uh, tend to think of this as a more polarized time because I think it literally is. Because people are, are, are finding dissatisfaction with the status quo and are grasping it one way or another to, to give them answers. So it's either going to be the people that are, are saying things should be different are either going to be fascists who, I mean, we know why they want things different, or leftists who want a bigger share for everybody. You know, more democracy in the workplace, more freedom to live your life as you as you please, uh, both economically and just socially. Um, so yeah, th- those are basically the, the ways that people break, and it's and, and it and it shows the lack of opportunity in the status quo, uh, and the lack of promise for the future for the status quo. And you know, and then we have, and then enters Joe Biden and basically just offering you more of the same. Nothing will fundamentally change, and so far it hasn't really fundamentally changed. And, you know, 
still his first year, but I'm not holding out much hope. 